The Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verses 1, and then 20 to 21. Hear the word of God. Moses convened all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances that I am addressing to you today. You shall learn them and observe them diligently. Neither shall you covet your neighbor's wife, neither shall you desire your neighbor's house or field or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm comes from Psalm 77, and as always, you all are not bolded, you all are bolded. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, that he may hear me. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your might among the peoples. With your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The clouds poured out water, the skies thundered, your arrows flashed on every side. Your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters, yet your footprints were unseen. The New Testament reading comes from Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Again, hear the word of God. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But fornication and impurity of any kind or greed must not even be mentioned among you, as is proper among saints. Entirely out of place is obscene, silly, and vulgar talk, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Be sure of this, that no fornicator or impure person or one who is greedy, that is, an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be associated with them, for once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. <coughs> Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, brothers and sisters, here we are, the Tenth Commandment, at long last. You shall not covet, not your neighbor's wife or husband, 
Not your neighbor's house, not their possessions, nothing that belongs to them. Covet isn't really a word we use a lot anymore. So maybe it's clear to put it this way. Don't set your heart on anything that's your neighbor's. It's not the same thing as just admiring or liking. My mom and I like to drive through old historic neighborhoods and look at the pretty houses. That doesn't break this commandment. I absolutely adore Diane and Terry's dog, <laughs> Winchester. That doesn't break this commandment either. My heart is not set on owning him, which is fortunate for me. I love that dog, but I don't have an inordinate desire for him. I don't spend my time daydreaming or plotting about how I might get hold of him. I'm being silly, but you know the kind of desire I'm talking about. That kind of gnawing dissatisfaction that you sometimes get when you see something someone else has. This commandment tells us to not even want, not long, don't plot, to add to your own possessions by taking something that belongs to someone else. According to the God of freedom, setting your heart on something that rightly belongs to someone else is a kind of slavery. Avoid it. We've discovered this summer that all the commandments do have something to do with your heart, especially when Jesus is the one doing the interpreting. But this is the first commandment we've encountered, this last one, that only has to do with your interior life, and nothing at all to do with behavior. This last commandment is solely aimed at your attitudes and desires, at your heart and what it's set on. Even so, it's easy to wonder if we even need this 10th commandment. Why not just have nine? Isn't God repeating himself here? It says not to covet our neighbor's property, but we've already been told that stealing and the attitudes that lead to it are a kind of slavery. It says not to covet our neighbor's spouse, but we've heard the warning already that we become enslaved when we commit adultery or even look at someone who's not our spouse with lustful intent. Coveting might lead to murder, like it did when Jezebel killed Naboth for the sake of the vineyard that her husband wanted. But isn't that covered in the commandment not to commit murder? We often write these commandments in a list, one to ten, with one at the top of the paper and ten at the bottom, the straight line of the will of God for your life. But what if it's not a line? What if it's a circle instead? That's what we seem to get from today's reading from Ephesians. It says that greedy people, people who habitually set their heart on things that don't belong to them. Idolaters, along with sexual immorality, which is another kind of grasping. It's to set your heart on something that doesn't belong to you, whether that's a person or a possession, is apparently a kind of idolatry. We're back to the first commandment. You shall have no other God beside or before the God who brought you out of slavery. That's the key to avoiding covetousness, apparently. The way to keep your heart from being set on things that aren't yours, that rightly belong to other people, is for your heart to be so full of God that there's not space for it to be overwhelmed with desire for something else. If I ever manage to stop filling my heart with desire for other people's gardens or houses or families, or possessions, or experiences, or dogs. It's going to be because I've figured out what it means to keep the first commandment, to have no other God but this God, 
the God of freedom. And if the Ten Commandments are a circle, we can keep going around it. When I fill my heart with no other God but this God, then I remember to worship him as he really is and not just how I imagine him to be. I delight to honor him and mimic what he's done, like a child mimics their parents, and to rely on him more than I rely on myself. When my heart is full of love for this sufficient, sovereign, loving father, then I'm free to honor and love other people as well by giving them rest, by honoring those in authority over me without defensiveness or anxiety, by not murdering them or desiring their harm, by not intruding on their marriages, by not depriving them of the good gifts that God has given them by stealing, by not using lies or even the truth to harm them. And when my heart is full to bursting with this love for God and my neighbor, then I will not want to harbor in my heart even the desire to live another way, not even the most quiet or hidden envy for what God has given someone else that calls into question God's love for me. And here we go round again. I don't have to call into question my love for my neighbor because the God of love and freedom has given himself to be my God, back to the first. This unending cycle of love is the life that God calls us to in these Ten Commandments and all throughout Scripture. Follow God's example, therefore, says Ephesians, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. In Exodus, once God told Moses not just the Ten Commandments, but also chapters and chapters of other rules and regulations that we're tempted to skip, first because they're boring, and second because it seems like they have no impact on our life. But they also display the loving and glorious holiness of the God and his concern for his people. Once he gets through all those, though, Moses goes back to his people, down off the mountain, and they make a covenant with God, which is like a promise to live in relationship with God, to live in the way of freedom and love, the circle that he lays out. Listen, this is Exodus chapter 24. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up twelve pillars corresponding to the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed oxen as offerings of well-being to the Lord. Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he dashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. Moses took the blood and dashed it on the people and said, See the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there was something like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. God did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel, and so they beheld God, and they ate and drank. 
This is a pattern that we base our worship services off of, that we base today off of. It says that Moses read aloud to the people from the Book of the Covenant in which the Lord's commands were written. That's what we've done very intentionally this summer, listened to the will of the God of freedom for our lives. When we read scripture anytime in a sermon, not just when we're talking about the Ten Commandments, we read scripture and explain it. We seek to hear and understand the will of God with the intention to obey it at our best. We do have a prayer of confession every week because we're not always at our best. But when at our best, this is what we seek to do. Once the people heard it, they said, we will obey the Lord and do everything he has commanded. In just a minute, I will ask you to affirm your faith using an ancient creed of the church, the Nicene Creed. And faith, you know, doesn't just mean knowledge. It means trust. The creed asks us not to affirm just our knowledge of God, but also our trust in him. And we will rise and do so using the words that Christians have used for centuries. And we will mean by it what the people of Israel meant when they said, we will obey the Lord and do everything that he's commanded. And then, just like they did, will seal the covenant. Just like they did, we will gather around a table and eat and drink together. But we won't be eating the meat from cattle that we sacrificed. We'll be eating bread that participates in the body of Christ, who, as Paul says in our reading from Ephesians, loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. By God's grace, that eating will bind us together with all Christians in all times and all places and with Christ himself to be his body. And no one's going to throw blood at us. So if you are worried about that, don't be. But we will drink from the cup of the new covenant sealed in the blood of Jesus Christ. A lot happens when you eat that bread and drink that cup. But among them is that you reaffirm your covenant with the gracious God that Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel saw when they ate and drank together on that mountain. That's the same God who is present to us now at all times, but in a special way when we eat and drink this meal together. So may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.